So greetings from Budapest and uh, greetings from uh, from here to all of my uh, friends who are in, now in Zagreb. And uh, thank you very much for this great conference and the great discussions. And as you will see, there will be many, many connections between my presentation and the previous one by Professor Lech Leitner. Research on the history of Hungarian sound recordings, which started in the last third of the 20th century, tries with little success to sort out the international labyrinths of the recording industry, or on the contrary, with clever or even un ambiguous formation, formulations, the authors leave the origins and national affiliation of a record company in obscurity. The majority of works on Hungarian record history focus only on Hungarian events and phenomena. And as a result, we often get only get half of the histories. Furthermore, due to the difficult structure of the international record companies, these works sometimes generalize incorrectly. Even more typical, of course, is the fact that in order to glorify the Hungarian recording history, they present something as being entirely Hungarian, when it is not. In the background of these problems, we can find the nature of the medium itself. In, in the case of commercially released discs, the tangible output, that is the disc itself, is very often the result of the work of several countries. And the vast majority of record companies present in Hungary at any given time were international record companies. The problems discussed in this presentation are, of course, not only valid in the early decades of the history of sound recordings, but are equally relevant in the CD era or in the world of today's multinational sound recording companies. However, in the case of the early recordings, the geographical conditions of the first half of the 20th century, that is the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and its successor states, make the discussion more difficult. Most of the major international record companies saw the Central European area as a unified market. The gramophone company, later his master's voice, used the language-based catalog system in which the sound recordings of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy were dispensed in at least two separate catalogs, the 40,000 catalog for German language recordings, which of course included sound recordings made in Germany, and the 70,000 Central European catalog, launched in 1902 for the other languages of the monarchy. The system not only was not adapted to national borders, but was also completely unsuitable to the countries which used languages outside the mainstream operatic repertoire. The Italian and German language Budapest recordings of some foreign-born members of the Royal Hungarian Opera House, such as Italia Molina Vasquez, were classified into different catalogues not to mention the recordings of the Jewish cantors of Budapest, which were also placed into another catalog. As it is well known, the gramophone company established a general agency in many cities from Europe to Asia, including Budapest in 1904. Each general agency was assigned a territory in which it managed the company's affairs, above all the trade and the organization of recording sessions for that area. And as at the time most of the Balkan states were under the Budapest branch, it was up to the head of the Budapest branch to decide whether to make recordings in Belgrade, Sarajevo, or even Zombor in a given year. This explains why, as Risto Pekka Pendanen's research revealed, Friedrich Konrad, staff member of the Budapest branch of the gramophone company, accompanied the sound expert Franz Hampe to Sarajevo in May 1907 to make Bosnian recordings. The territories were sometimes reorganized. At the beginning of 1911, for example, Croatia, Serbia, Dalmatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Montenegro were all included in the territory of the Budapest branch. In March of that year, Bulgaria and Romania, which until then had been directly under the office in Berlin, were also transferred to the Budapest branch. As a result, the recordings in Budapest, Belgrade, and Sofia in October 1911 were organized by the head of the Budapest General Agency, Heinrich Konrad. 
Consequently, the schedule and itinerary of the recording experts can be understood only in international context. With the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, this common market was fragmented, with Budapest's regional leadership declining significantly and Prague's increasing. But the links have not disappeared. The largest record factory in Central Europe was still that of the gramophone company HMB in Ustinad Laben, formerly Aussie. Between 1920 and 1938, the Ustinad Laben record factory produced around 12,000 records in different languages, including Polish, Romanian, Bulgarian, and Hungarian, as well as Czech, of course. This is how the Hungarian records of the British record company, which returned to the Hungarian market in 1925, could for a while still build the inscription record manufactured by the gramophone company Czechoslovakia, and so on. The Ustinad Labem record factory produced the first releases of the significant 1928 HMV Hungarian music series which contained an exclusively Hungarian repertoire ordered by the Hungarian Ministry of Culture. Obviously, these releases cannot be considered as Czechoslovak records because of the place of the pressing, although some Hungarian discographers tried to do that, not to mention the fact that his master's voice was not a Czechoslovak record company. However, it would also be a distortion distortion to present this series of records as an entirely Hungarian achievement. It was precisely the foreign background of the record company that gave the journalist of Honi Ipor, that is national industry, a reason to criticize the Minister of Culture for having a foreign record company produce the series, while there was a Hungarian company at the time, Eternola, with possibility of making gramophone discs. Of course, Eternola was not an entirely Hungarian company either. Edison Bell Phonograph Co Corporation Limited began to expand internationally in the second half of the 1920s. In 1926, it set up a record factory in collaboration with the Yugoslav inventor Slavo Jupenkala's company in Zagreb. In the following year, Edison Bell International Limited was established as a subsidiary to handle international distribution. It was with this company that the Hungarian Eternal Mechanikai Részvénytársaság signed the contract at the end of 1927, and in October 1928, its recording activities began in Budapest. The Hungarian Eternal Edison Bell records were initially pressed in London and later at the Penkala Record Factory in Zagreb. This has led to misunderstandings in at least one case, which resulted in a recording rarity of Hungarian musical historical significance. According to the former Hungarian discographical research, Ernő Dohnányi made two recordings for Edison Bell, Beethoven's Furelis and his own March Opus 17 No. 1. The disc survived in the original couplings with several different catalog numbers, but quite unusually, with three different pairs of matrix numbers. In the case of a reissue, the com company would in principle retain the previous matrix numbers. However, if the recordings are different, the question arises as to why the record company would release two or three different recordings of the same repertoire with the same performer. Detailed computational analysis of the recordings revealed two interesting phenomena. On the one hand, the recordings are almost identical, down to the last agogical detail, which is quite surprising, since Dohnányi's performance style is considered to be notoriously spontaneous. On the other hand, the close listening of the recording with the lowest matrix number has revealed two mistakes of Dohnányi in his own composition, which are not audible on the recording with the higher matrix number. The extremely valuable and fortunately preserved notes of the sound engineer Paul Foigt provided further evidence. He himself noted that Dohnányi's Edison Bell recording in Budapest had not been well done technically. Nevertheless, the record was pressed in the London factory. It seems that sometime later Dohnányi re-recorded the two piano pieces, but these recordings were sent to the Zagreb factory for production and the matrices were stored there. And in 1934, when Edison Bell was part of DECA, they reissued the earlier recordings from the matrices preserved in London, 
very likely not knowing that a better improved recording existed. There are many further examples of the links of the record production and record trade in the successor states of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. A unified Central European distribution was the idea of Duophon Limited of London, which set up the Central European Duophon Factory Limited in Budapest in 1929. From the statutes of the company, we know that this company was granted the use of the patent registered under the Duophon trademark not only in Hungary, but also in Austria, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Romania and Bulgaria. The relations between the Czechoslovak and Hungarian recording history could be traced at length. The Czechoslovak record company, ESTA, had a Hungarian series, which contained not only Hungarian-related repertoire, but also recordings of international interest, for example, Antonin Dvořák's well-known Humoresque, released and also pressed in Hungary. Hungarian jazz bands made recordings in Prague between the two world wars for several international labels, and in the 1950s, many Hungarian artists, such as Anne Fischer, Gyurcs Cifra, and József Simandi, made recordings in Prague for Supraphon. Finally, some recordings of the Hungarian Radiola Disc Factory were reissued in Poland on the Balto label, a connection which still has to be revealed. However, even if it seems that for an all Hungarian record company it is enough to know Hungarian conditions, we might be wrong. Első Magyar Hanglemezgyár, that is first Hungarian record company, founded in 1908, was the only independent Hungarian record company before 19, mm, 1918. However, its activities were not confined to the territory of Hungary at the time. Not only did the company have a wide repertoire covering all genres, but non-Hungarian recordings also made up a significant part of its catalog. As a first step towards an international presence, the Hungarian record company opened a branch in Vienna in August 1908, where the long and complicated Hungarian company name, which was not suitable for foreign distribution, was replaced by the shorter Premier record. The Vienna branch used, beside the original label, a special Black Art Nouveau label to distribute the company's Vienna-related recordings. As early as September 1908, the idea of expanding the business eastwards, mainly into Russia and the Balkans, was mooted. The Sofia firm, George S. Ginev, undertook the re to represent the Hungarian company in Bulgaria, Serbia, and the European part of Turkey. Furthermore, from, from a letter from June 1909, we know that the for Warsaw firm Andershaus A. Kustin represented the Hungarian record company in Russia. It is remarkable how seriously the company took the supply of records to the nationalities living in Hungary at the time, but it also operated beyond the borders of the monarchy. The most detailed list of the linguistic diversity of its publications can be found in the February 1912 issue of Phonographisch Zeitschrift, which listed Hungarian, German, Austrian, Serbian, Romanian, Slovene, Slovak, Czech, Croatian, Turkish, Armenian, Russian, Polish, Tatar, Yiddish and Hebrew recordings. The German language discs include not only Viennese recordings, but also musical and prose recordings by Germans in Hungary. By 1912, the repertoire of the company included all the languages of the Balkan states, making it a major player in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy's record trade. The Tatar language may at first seem surprising in the above list, but, but as Will Prentice pointed it out on the basis of the archive documents of EMI, Frederick Tyler, the representative of the gramophone company in Tbilisi, considered the Hungarian record company as a significant local competitor between 1909 and 1911. At the end of the summer of 1909, the gramophone company's sound engineer, Franz Hampe, was in competition with a local representative of the Hungarian premier record to record the best performers on gramophone records in the area across the Caspian Sea. Furthermore, the first Hungarian record company had a representative in Samarkand, today Uzbekistan and was very active. In April 1910, he brought 10,000 premier record discs to the city. 
A few months later, Frederick Tyler, the representative of the gramophone company in Tbilisi, wrote to his superior complaining that the first Hungarian record company not only had an excellent local repertoire, but also had made excellent business deals with local dealers. The first Hungarian record company advertised its recordings in different languages in separate catalogues and loose leaves. And based on the currently available copies, we must even add Italian to the languages listed above. The company's recordings were not only made in Budapest. In the autumn of 1911, Antal Greiner made recordings in Turkey and Lemberg. And there were made recordings by the company in Novi Sad, Bucuresti, Ljubljana, and so on, and immediately before the outbreak of World War I in Panchevo. Moreover, although the first Hungarian record company initially advertised that it did not take over licensed recordings, but only marketed its own recordings, it has recently came to light that the company's general agency in Russia had also been releasing discs under its own brand name during 1910-1911 as licensed, or in the worst case, pirated copies of the Russian record company Sirena in Warsaw. On these seemingly Hungarian discs, we find, for example, recordings of Russian opera singers from Warsaw and St. Petersburg. The history and exploration of these, as well as the activities of the first Hungarian record company in the Caucasus, require further international research. Overall, it can be said that in the history of commercial record production, it is not at all clear what is national and what is not. I think that the history of the Hungarian recording industry is worth examining, at least in a Central European context. Indeed, I would argue, argue, I would argue that the discographers of the successor states of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy are interdependent. In order to get discographies and recording histories as complete as possible, they need to be informed about the discological research in the neighboring states and be in contact with each other. I will not go into a very important factor here, the availability of sources at the institutional sound archives and private collections, which I know is a very complicated issue. But rather, I will mention that there are many fascinating data on the activity and local reception of Electroton and Yugoton in the Hungarian language newspapers of Yugoslavia. Or the same can be said about Suprafon and Electrecord in the Hungarian journals of Czechoslovakia and Romania. And as Ivana Vesic informed me yesterday, Hungarian radio programming was being commented from time to time in Radio Belgrade Weekly. As in many other fields of musicology, see fragmentology, for example, in discology, it is not enough for the researchers to be familiar only with the national conditions and phenomena of their own field of research. They also need to be familiar with the structure and history of the surrounding countries' record companies, as well as of the international record companies present in their own country, in order to understand the connections and to suspect what may seem to be obvious but it is, in fact, an exception. Thank you for your attention.